start talking now as people trickle in, because hopefully they'll hear my voice and come, and also what I have to say is not nearly as important as what they have to say. Okay, so welcome everyone to the Northern Exchange stage. We're, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm Heather Bhandari, co-founder of Art World Learning. Art World Learning is happy to partner with Expo today, so thank you to Kate and Tony for inviting us to be part of this, and thank you to the West Collection for supporting us to bring these panels to Chicago. Um, welcome. For those of you who don't know us, um, I am representing Art World Learning. It's an education platform developed for those in the creative sector that consists of two programs. One is Art World Learning which is an online video-based course on video courses on bi business and financial health for creatives, and to Art World Conference, which is actionable, actionable, inclusive workshops and events, both in person and online, focused on building and sustaining diverse careers and communities in the arts. Um, our overarching belief is that financial health and sustainability for cultural producers is a social justice issue and the key to equity and inclusion in the arts. Um, this is our second panel today, and it's on the future of values-driven art collecting, collecting with your conscience. Because of our artist-driven mission, Art World Learning was faced with an interesting challenge when developing programming for an art fair. And um, in front of esteemed collectors of yourself, um, this, was, this was an interesting project. Financial health is the focus of our program, and collecting clearly has an important financial component. But there is also so much more. National news often focuses on auction results, but today we're interested in the grassroots, community-based support systems in the arts and how collectors fit into that ecosystem, supporting, in a more holistic sense, culture and artists in their communities, while also taking into account historical inequities and injustice. We're absolutely thrilled to have our four panelists here. Ada Pinkston, who's an artist, is gonna facilitate a conversation between Shawanda Roundtree, Henry Thaggart, and Vesela Stratenovich. Um, their bios are amazing and very long, so I'm going to keep them short. And then they're gonna speak for about 40 minutes, discuss this topic amongst themselves, and then you guys are more than welcome to ask questions. We'll have a mic that we'll pass around. So first, here are the bios. Ada Pinkston is a multimedia artist, educator, and organizer living and working in Baltimore, Maryland. Born in New York, her artistic research interests span the social sciences, global colonial histories, American studies, and community art practices. Her work has been featured in a variety of spaces, including the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Walters Art Museum, the Peel Museum, Transmodern Performance Festival, PS1, the New Museum, Light City, Baltimore, and the streets of Berlin, Baltimore, Orlando, Washington, D.C., and New York. She has presented lectures on public spaces at the French Embassy, NYU, UCLA, and the National Gallery of Art. She's also an alumnus of the Monument Lab and Goth Institute Transnational Fellowship. And her most recent work can be found in the permanent collection of LA's LA County Museum of Art. Next, we have Shwanda Roundtree an attorney, art collector, and independent art consultant who's worked with galleries domestically and internationally, placing contemporary art in museums and private collections. She currently serves as collections committee member of the Auckland Art Museum, national advisory board member of the Auckland Art Museum, professional arts consultant for the Joan Mitchell Foundation, and a sessions committee member of the Baltimore Museum of Art. She's also served as advisory panel member of Culture DC, an executive board member of the Porter Colloquium on African American Art and a member of Art Table. Recently, she was featured in Art News and had an Inside My Collection editorial profile on Artsy. Next, we have Henry Thaggart, a collector, curator, and arts patron in Washington, DC, where he's also a corporate attorney at a Fortune 500 company. He served on boards of several institutions, including the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, and the Millennium Art Salon an educational nonprofit focused on African-American art and culture. Henry's a passion, he's passionate about supporting black artists and women artists and promoting increased representation of marginalized groups in traditionally white art institutions. He's loaned and donated work from his personal collection to the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven and the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, among other museums. 
And last but definitely not least, we have Vesla Stratinovich, a longtime curator of modern and contemporary art with special interests in cross-disciplinary art practices. She's been at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. since 2009 first a senior curator of modern and contemporary art, and now as a cross-departmental director of contemporary art initiatives and partnerships. During her tenure, she initiated and oversaw a series of intersections, inviting contemporary artists to engage with the museum's permanent collection and architecture to create new works. Participating artists included A. Bala Submaranian, Sanford Biggers, Los Carpinteros, Ranjani Shetter, Allison Schatz, and Richard Tuttle. Vesela's monographic ex exhibitions included the first museum retrospective of Cuban artist Zilia Sanchez. Prior to the Phillips, Vesela was curator of the Bell Gallery at Brown University while teaching contemporary art and theory at RISD. She's also worked at the University of Buffalo and the Brooklyn Museum of Art. She holds a BA from the University of Belgrade, an MA from right here, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and a PhD from Syracuse. So everyone, please join me in welcoming our four panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, can everyone hear me? I heard, yeah? Okay, cool. Well, I'm so excited to start this conversation, and I know we have very limited time. So let's start it off with what does it mean to be a collector for you? And then what does it mean to be a curator for you? Henry, you go first. Sure. Um, it's easier for you. You think so? Uh, what it means to be a collector for me. Um, well, I grew up uh, in, uh, I have to give you some background. I grew up in a uh, single family home uh, raised by my mom. Uh, and, and she raised uh, three children and uh, had always kept us busy by involving us in the arts, um, whether that was you know, crafts or you know, music lessons or you know, art lessons at the library or even taking us to museums. Um, it, was, it was our activity, it was something we always did uh, to stay busy and it, was never, it never felt uh, or she never made it feel like it was um, special, if you know what I mean. We didn't put on our Sunday best to go to, go to a museum, it was just, something we always did. So arts, the arts have always been a part of my life. Um, I've always thought a lot about art, read about art growing up, uh, and ultimately uh, I went to law school to work in the arts. Uh, I went to NYU, and somehow while at NYU I got off track and became a corporate lawyer uh, and uh, ended up working uh, in uh, corporations and with the government. Meanwhile, I continued my passion for art and uh, would uh, put together small exhibitions. Um, in 2004 or five, I was in a privileged position uh, to acquire art. And the, the first work I ever acquired uh, was uh, a Kehinde Wiley. I had this uh, extra, um, extra wad of cash and so I, emailed Jeffrey Deitch out of the blue and said, um, I'm looking at your website, I'd like uh, this picture on page three of your website. No response. Um, so I sent another email a few weeks later, uh, hi, Mr. Deitch, uh, I'm Henry Thaggart, I would like to buy that picture on your web <laughs> from your website. Uh, and it was at that point someone explained to me that uh, the role of an important gallery like Deitch in New York City at the time was to ensure that the work went to, quote, good homes. And so I was like, oh, okay, now I get it, and just sort of forgot about it. And then sometime after that, I received an email uh, at work, and it said, from, it said, Jeffrey Deitch. And I sort of uh, was a little nervous, and it, the subject line was, Kehende Wiley. And I uh, opened the email, and it, it was a very nice email, and said, dear Mr. Thaggart, Mr. Wiley would like you to, quote, have this picture. And I looked at the picture and it was astounding. It was absolutely beautiful. And he said, by the way, uh, Mr. Wiley uh, did some research and you, you all know XYZ people in common. And so it turned out that uh, Kehinde and Deitch uh, were doing their research on me just as I had done my research on the artist. Um, 
And uh, it was much later that I met Kahende Wiley for the first time. And it was in DC at, one of, at an exhibition. And I, uh, I went up to him, I was very effusive. I said, uh, thank you so much. You know, thank you so much for selling me this picture. But, and you know, there are people standing around us sort of listening to this conversation. And Kahende sort of just stopped me and he said, look, he says, um, you know, I fully recognize that um, what I do for a living in part is create wealth creating tools for rich people. And anytime I can privilege a young black collector, I will do that. Um, he didn't give me a painting, he sold me a painting, but he helped me by putting me at the top of a list. And that is one of the most seminal life experiences, life lessons for me. It, 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 it taught me that although art collecting is fun, um, it's, it could be a serious, it could be a serious business. It can create wealth. Um, and when you think about how African Americans, you know, have been redlined and system, systematized uh, and excluded from wealth creating um, practices and systems in the United States, you know, it, it just made me realize how important art collecting and serious it can be. So with that perspective about collecting, I have tried to be I tried to pay it forward, tried to pay, pay it back by being a very passionate collector um, and patron and partner with young artists and, in hopes that you know, we can raise uh, young artists with the same values that uh, Kehende exhibited. Thank you. That was a really um, thoughtful response. Vasila, did you want to go? Okay. Um, I will just, uh, since you started personal, I'll say, uh, I'll start it the same way. Um, my parents hoped th for me to be an artist. Very rare to hear that. I grew up uh, in Belgrade, former Yugoslavia, and the notion of collecting did not exist. In a socialist country, you live with art. You do not collect. Art is part of the commune and something you share with. And. Um, I came to this country, to this city, to, for my graduate degree, and um, the notion of collecting um, developed, evolved around the years, and starting to work as a curator um, at different institution, it also changed, I have to say, on a personal level. When I was at UB Buffalo, or SUNY Buffalo, um, shopping around galleries was a different experience than doing that with my brown ID or doing that with the Philips business card. So there is a status we carry with us, the context, and um, um, we have to face it that way. Whether it's fair or not, that's just how it works. Similar to your experience, you have to be on a waiting list in order to get a work of art. Uh, you can't just have it by default. Um, that is a learning experience, but also responsibility. So collecting for yourself is a one thing, and. Um, I still say I live with art personally, and uh, as a member of an institution, as a representative of the institution, yes, we're a collecting institution. So with that, I just want to give a little bit of information about the Phillips collection for you, of, for, for you who may not know about us. We're the first museum of modern art um, in the United States, and we take a pride of being before MoMA, founded in uh, 2000. Uh, 2000, excuse me, uh, 1921, so last year was our 100th anniversary. And another thing that uh, people don't know often about the Phillips is um, that it really started off uh, with a passion and vision of Duncan Phillips, who wanted to support art of his own time. Over the years, Phillips turned into a bastion of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist art. This is the time of the 80s and the 90s. And the legacy of Duncan Phillips, and that is to support artists of his own time, was forgotten. Well, with the new directorship, not anymore new, but 15 years ago, uh, Dorothy Kozinski, and then my hire, which was the first contemporary curator at the Phillips, things have changed, and they have been evolving ever since. The, the emphasis is really given to the art of our time and today. And uh, of course, we live in a time of uh, diversifying in a good sense on all levels. The collection has incredibly expanded. Um, over 15 years, we acquired more than 1,000 works of art. And I'll just give a, some figures. 
Um, Matt is always good, handy. Uh, we have about, it's a still small collection, about 5,000 works altogether, mostly paintings, but also works on paper. And the collection of photography increased most of all. Um, we have only about 150 sculptures and only about 10 or 15 works of digital art, speaking that the previous panel was an NFT. We do not have any NFT yet. Who knows? Um, so, given the climate we're in, given the broadening of the awareness, um, and also following the passion of the founder, the collection and the principle of collecting are very... I would say elastic. Uh, what we're known for is a um, museum that doesn't follow the movements or isms in modernisms. And therefore, the collecting principles of Duncan Phillips were to follow his own passion, intuition, and juxtaposition of all arts throughout periods, throughout geographic or geopolitical um, areas, and also create visual juxtapositions among artists of today and the past and compare the masters, as he called them, and the living artists. And we kind of try to follow that vision uh, and put artists of today vis-a-vis -vis the artists of the past and create interesting relationship. When I started uh, at that time, Dorothy Kozinski said to me, go slowly in terms of introducing contemporary art vis-a-vis -vis the moderns or the masters. And I still remember that. And I think things have changed radically in the 15 years um, um, from then. But it's amazing how long it takes to build or establish certain um, modus operandi, to say, or to change things. It takes so little to deconstruct things and so much to build something new, build new canons, build new images. And being a contemporary curator for so long, I think it's only now that we are getting recognitions for showcasing art of today. Contemporary artists that are very, you know, coming from all parts of the world, uh, engaging different medias, different issues, and really being responsive to today. And the idea for the future, and not just the idea, but the practice of today and the future is to go that direction even more so, especially being in DC, where we are surrounded, which this is what I think DC has above New York and everybody else, and that is surrounding um, of embassies and our partnerships with embassies and international and global um, venues is what gives us unique position, and we try to benefit from them and also, at the same time, recognize the artists in the area. Because DC is known for the museums, but there is no gallery support, and the collecting support is very, very minimal. Therefore, I think that the obligation of us museums in DC is to give opportunity to our artists that are incredible and under-recognized and invisible. So we're running the parallel track, and our obligation is to continue to do that. This is in brief. Yeah, thank you. You really touched on a lot of different points there. So the, the original question, Shwanda, was what does it mean to be a collector for you? And I think both of you guys, I mean, so you mentioned what it means to be a curator in the context of the larger praxis of the word, right? Within the institution and then thinking about the institutional relationship to individual artists and I wonder for you, like, what does it mean? What is your relationship to artists and institutions? And how do you negotiate and navigate that? Well, just to sort of answer your initial question, when I collect, I have legacy and representation in mind, personally. Um, I'm building a collection for my family. Um, and I'm building a collection so that my children and my friends and people around me see images of things that are familiar, um, that resonates with them, and that's something that um, I didn't grow up with. And so um, I started out collecting in 2002, right out of law school, and um, a lot of my friends who had just graduated got their um, desired jobs at like law firms, at the big law firms, and they were spending money on 
cars and trips and, you know, just indulging in things that obviously people wanted to do after working so hard um, in grad school or law school. And I made a small little pact to myself to um, try to support the arts um, and just culture in general um, in my own uh, little way. So um, I'll share a story. Um, there was a, a show in DC, it was called Anonymous at the time. And uh, basically there were works in which um, that would be on display, but you just didn't know who the artists were. And so all the works I believe were at $500. And, um, and so I'd already previewed the show, the images, but you know, no one really knows who, who the work is for sure. You're just sort of guessing. And I had my eye on this, this piece by Michael Platt. Um, he has now passed away, but he was a phenomenal um, photographer um, based in DC. And um, I thought, oh gosh, I have to get this, this Michael Platt because you know, my, my budget was very minimal at the time. And I knew the work was valued at more than $500. So um, there was a long line um, to be able to sort of place your bid on, on a work and a friend of mine um, helped me out, stood in the line, got the work for me for $500. Um, and that was my first piece of, of art that I had in a collection. Um, and I just started building from there, just really being focused on, on budget. Um, obviously, I didn't really have legacy in mind at that point. It was just more of like um, acquiring things that I really loved and was passionate about. And then, um, you know, it sort of developed into an organic experience where I was like going up to New York, you know, like literally every weekend and, and going on studio visits. And I remember um, going up to New York and doing a studio visit with Titus Kafar. And um, at the time, you know, they were my sort of contemporaries in terms of like age and us knowing each other and having um, familiar friends. And um, I went over to Shanique Smith's um, you know, studio as well, and uh, and so obviously, you know, the natural part of that in um, going to the studio is, is acquiring a, a work or um, trying to support the artist. Um, and I think at the time, you know, they were sort of fresh out of um, their studies, so the work was was quite accessible. Now that I think about it, but I do remember at the time it felt like a huge sacrifice to to be able to acquire their works. Um, so in terms of my like, you know, relationship um, with artists, it's definitely very earnest and sincere in terms of really trying to learn what the, um, the scholarship behind the work and what moves them in um, their studio practice. And also um, really keeping my finger on the pulse of what type of um, scholarship is leading in the institution, in the, you know, with the institutions and the museums and trying to figure out what um, moves the curators. And so I'm in constant conversation as well with um, curators at museums. And I do follow like the younger curators who are, you know, um, just sort of refining their, um, their focus or new to an institu um, institution because I really think that um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of them are really in tune with what's going on socially, like right now. Um, and I try, things that I add to my collection, I try to have that focus as well as like, what is the messaging behind the work? Um, you know, what is really dri driving the artists and what's uh, moving them on an emotional level? Um, I don't take it for granted what they're sharing with us. It's an offering of sorts. And once it gets into my space, there is an actual emotional shift. Like, I can feel it. Um, right now, I just got another um, place and I had to, you know, move all the works off the wall. And now I'm in a blank space. And uh, it's quite interesting, like, the shift of energy when you don't have any works um, in the space. And so for me, it's definitely, it comes from a place of um, passion you know, and uh, joy, you know. And then when I actually see as, you know, a, a young mother, mother, young kids to see their reaction to the work, you know, 
um, it really um, is telling how impactful it is to have, you know, be surrounded by that culture. Um, and I don't take it for granted because collecting art is a very, like, privileged, elitist space. Like, and, you know, we can talk about that a little further in terms of some of the, uh, the um, hurdles that, you know, I faced as a collector. I don't know, you know, if um, my cohort, collecting cohort, um, Henry has experienced the same, but uh, I find that in this market, sometimes it doesn't matter how much money you have, access is still an issue with regard to collectors of color. And so I'm really trying to um, uh, continue to build um, with the institutions um, and making sure that there is works that are placed in permanent collections. Now, um, there are several ways that you can do that. Um, now, I feel a little um, honored to be at the level where I've been buying, you know, things here and there and actually donating them to the museums. I never really thought that I would get to that, to that level. I always thought that was like someone who had amassed a, a, an amazing amount of work um, over time or you had to be deceased or something to like, uh, you know, place works in, in an institution. But I am trying to, you know, create a small little footprint or path um, and trying to also inspire others to, to do what they can. Um, so I've placed some things in museums, but I've also, um, if a work is offered to me and I know that I can't, you know, really afford it or um, it's on a much larger scale, I've really been um, trying to make sure that I have some impact on placing it into institutions. And I'll tell you an, another little um, story. The first work that I placed in a major museum um, was a Yinko ba uh, Shanabari um, sculpture. I don't know, it's maybe like seven foot tall sculpture called Girl on Globe, um, but the Corcoran Museum, and it's now in the permanent collection at the National um, Gallery of Art in their contemporary um, collection. And to be able to like go there and take my kids there and say, I had a part in this, you know, um, it's so meaningful, um, and since then I've been able to like, you know, I placed a, a Sanford Biggers um, video um, in the um, Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, trying to push mo moving media into spaces, and I've had, you know, um, you know, some just some part in, in that process. Um, so I feel honored in that regard, and I think the relationship with the institutions and the artists are very important. Um, when you know, when you think about those elements, Henry, were you going to say something about that? Or? Yeah, um, yeah. Shwanda said something that triggered um, triggered her thought. I think another important role of what what we're calling the collector, but maybe it's also collecting and being a patron, uh, is working with the institutions and getting to know the institutions. But um, as these institutions uh, become more aware of uh, the African-American art market and start um, acquiring the works and doing large exhibitions, uh, I think an important role for, for us as collectors, black collectors, is first of all to congratulate them on, you know, on moving forward, but to also uh, pay attention to the history and the omissions uh, and the past. Um, it, it, it's, uh, I think it's really important to continue to ask institutions about their past, you know, that's great that you're doing a show of 30 black artists um, today, but why did it take so long? You know, why, you know, why did it, uh, why didn't you do a show about this, you know, 10 years ago and, you know, and solicit answers and get to get these institutions to be reflective about their past and not forget um, their complicitness in, um, and the omission of black people or people of color from the art world. You know, you don't get a pass just because, you know, you have, you're, you're opening a show now that celebrates black culture. I think that's our, a very important role for, that we can play. And I, I want to add and something. And I wasn't talking about the Phillips. No, 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 no. I, I didn't take it that way. But I want to say uh, from, from the museum side, First of all, many museums, the bigger the museum, the bigger bureaucracy. It just goes without saying. And it's about system, not individuals or individual shows. You might have like, n and no names attached, 
an institution might have put a show by a black artist or Cuban artist or unknown artist, but the recognition given to that show would not be as much as maybe it's of today because the climate has changed, the awareness has changed. So it, there is a domino effect. You can do something for a long time without any recognition. It takes time for the climate to change in order to re recognition to be fully um, endorsed. It's sad to say that, but that's the reality. That's an interesting point because as you were talking, it made me think about the David Driscoll show, that historical show and all the places that he went to shop it and no one took it, right? And then finally when someone did take it in LA, there were lines around the corner, right? But then it also made me, another point that Shwanda mentioned was the relationship with artists that I think is important to consider, right? So I, there's so many people that I know who were in grad school and different collectors come into their, their studios and buy their work before they're known and then poach them and then like resell them like five years later, right? So the question I have is how, what does, where, which is at the center of the practice, right? Is it ethics or is it aesthetics? And is it possible to um, do both? Both. I don't, I don't know if, uh, when, I, when, I think of, uh, when I think of doing both, because I, I did see this question, when I think of an example of doing both aesthetics and ethics at the same time, I think of like my grandmother and my aunt uh, who didn't have any art but had pictures of MLK, JFK, and Jesus. You know, that's like, to me, that's doing ethics and aesthetics. But I, think, I don't think most people can do one. I don't think a person could do both in the contemporary art world. I think you, I think you choose, and, and there's no wrong choice. My choice, um, I think uh, I, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm not interested in aesthetics. I, I'm, I'm saying that what drives my collecting and my acquisitions is um, a passion around understanding the concepts that uh, the artists are putting forward. Um, I, I'm very, very interested in conceptual work and the ideas behind work. Um, I, I wonder if uh, aesthetics, um, and, and I'm not talking about black artists now, let me be very clear, I'm talking about uh, black or white artists and artists in general. I think today a lot of artists rely too heavily on aesthetics, uh, especially in, you know, in, in, in the art fair setting as opposed to um, you know, uh, uh, understanding or developing a conceptual practice and theory behind your work and, and putting that forward. I was just going to say too in terms of <laughs> when it's the proper timing, I mean the climate has always been open for white artists forever, you know, so you know, there is no like strategic time as to when it's palatable to acquire, you know, black art, you know, in my opinion. Um, and in terms of ethics versus um, aesthetics, that's a really good question because I think now that um, social media is so strong and, you know, a lot of people, just the, the lay person wants to collect, I think that the elephant in the room is, you know, we want to talk about invest, the investment appeal. Like, you know, I think now, like the layperson who may not um, have studied art as much in terms of, you know, before they're collecting, they're, you know, the, the investment piece is a, an appeal to them because, you know, they want to make a quick buck. And that's just sort of the reality of, of it. And so when I'm helping to place works with clients, that is in the forefront of my mind is, is, is are they going to be um, sort of trying to take advantage of the artist? Is this a good, is this going to be a good custodian for this work and trying to be mindful of that and making sure that it's not like someone who's going to flip the work. I am, you know, very, um, very take that very seriously. And I also know that um, it's been an uphill battle for me to have access to good work, you know, um, Many people won't admit it, but you know, um, sometimes when work is offered, 
it's sort of like the, the remnants, so to speak, or things that um, are not sort of the prize, you know, works or the works that are not like on the level where um, the institutions would particularly want. It may be something that, that, you know, sort of in the early part of an artist's career when they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do, and then it's, and it's offered to an, a collector of color. And so um, I don't take advantage of the, or take it for, um, you know, sort of lightly that the good work that I'm offered, it's sort of difficult to have or acquire. And so I'm very mindful about where, it, where it's going, if the collector really understands what it means, and if they're going to really support um, one, the gallery's uh, portfolio long term, if they're not just, this is just like a one, one and done sort of situation, and if they're really gonna support the artist's um, studio practice. And I think that it extends beyond just buying a painting or a photograph or a video. When I say supporting an artist, I mean supporting their studio practice, you know? Um, there may be opportunities or times when an artist needs to, to travel in order to um, extend their studio practice or they may need some additional financial backing um, or grant support. And I think that, you know, sort of looking at artist support in a more expansive fashion is extremely important on the, you know, ethical side. Um, on the aesthetic side, for me, I collect with my eye, <laughs> um, but also with my mind in terms of the scholarship piece, not the investment piece, but do I love the work? Um, do I see, um, do I really understand what it means and am I drawn to the work? So. The aesthetics, it's hard because it's like that sometimes the aesthetics come first because I have an emotional reaction to the work, but then sometimes like the ethics come first as well. So it's, it's um, you sort of look at it, the work one by one um, in that regard. Yeah, yeah, just picking up on something Shwanda said uh, about um, expanding your relationship with the artist beyond just collecting the work. Um, I think that's really, really important. And if any of you are artists and you are wondering or thinking about how to establish your relationship with artists, I mean, excuse me, with collectors, remember there's more to a relationship than having, than the transaction, than having a uh, collector buy your work. Um, I, I am mentoring a, um, a, a young black female artist who um, uh, we be, we've become good friends, but I have not bought her work. Um, I, I, I could buy it any time, it'll be available. Um, she works in photography. Um, but what I, I have done for her is rather than spend my limited dollars uh, buying her work, I you know, uh, retained a lawyer to help her with her IP agreements and her license agreements. Um, so that when you know, she, uh, she ha has a documentary arrangement with a, f with a documentary film company, she's covered when, um, uh, an institution wants to publish her photograph in a non-art uh, publication in a journal. Um, she knows she has a she has a template for that, and I think you know that's far more valuable than me spending six hundred dollars on a photograph. So it, I just wanted to echo that point um, and expand on the point that Shwanda was really, was making. Good point. Well, I'm just going to reiterate what I said from the you know from the museum perspective, and that is ethics and aesthetics go together. Uh, but also my personal belief, and it goes back to the Henri Fossion, who is a French philosopher, theoretician from 19th century, and he would rephrase it in his own time, saying, form against content, it doesn't work. It has to coexist in art. Um, aesthetic is an old concept of 18th century, and it needs to be revised, especially with the digital media today. But there is a sense of beauty that we often forget, that we all carry and need in life so badly, as much as we need political agenda or social awareness. And I think in the West, we have a tendency to polarize things, and I'm very much against that. I'm like much more holistic views that there is a content and form, they have to come up together. There is aesthetics and ethics and our responsibility in how we see the world. And it's up to us individuals to carry that forward, whether we're personal collectors. Us, I'm jealous of you guys. Uh, we have, who wear institutional hats, have different kind of responsibility. And what I collect or what I live 
at home would be nothing what I do at work. So there are two parallel tracks. So, so not to put you on the spot, but um, uh, who are some of the artists, and I think I know who they are, but who are some of the artists that are combining uh, both ethics and aesthetics that you like you know, at the Phillips, like, well, for example? The most recent was Sanford Bickers. You knew that. Um, and uh, the, current art, the current exhibition we have is a Puerto Rican artist, uh, Marci uh, Marta Perez Garcia, uh, who exhibition is now in view, who I think um, thematically addresses all the issues of domestic violence. We're so aware, but we don't talk about. However, that said, I put that aside because when you walk into the exhibition, it's so haunting and visceral. And it's that materiality of her work and the experience, that bodily experience that to me parallel the impact and the, the subject matter of the work. So Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think uh, Sanford makes beautiful work, you know, like the, the giant tree with the piano coming out of it, you know, just absolutely beautiful. But I, when I encounter his work, the first thing I want to do is know what's going on, what's it about, and so that's what draws me first to the work. But there are so many different arts, and I, in that sense, you know, I, I'm for the diversity of media, subjects, concepts, conceptual art. Marley Dawson is somebody you know. It's an Australian artist who is very conceptual, but also very uh, object-driven. And that's a combination that triggers my curiosity. Or as a curator, as, on a personal level, I like to work with things I don't understand. Uh, because it is the process of understanding that enriches me individually and also um, enriches hopefully the experiences of the others. Yeah, beautiful, thanks. I mean, it was good to hear what's going on at the Phillips also. Um, let's go back to the conversation about um, collections and collections practices. Can you guys point to any outside of your own that are values driven? that inspire you? Um, I can speak to a collector who, the work that he has really inspires me just in terms of, when you look at the, the, the entire body of the work, um, Elliot Perry. Um, I remember seeing a, a photograph of a gentleman bent over with a pair of underwear on and you could see the blood on the underwear and I thought, wow, it's really brave of him to have that work in his space because it's very difficult to confront and see. And uh, people tend to have work in their space that is considered beautiful. And that's not you know, what you would characterize as, as a piece of beauty in a space because you're you know, confronted with what it means every time you walk by it. And so, um, when I look at his collection, he, he really takes risk in that regard. Um, and so that's been inspiring. He also um, collects emerging artists as well as the established, you know, considered established artists, mid-career artists, um, masterwork. So it's a very wholesome collection when you look at it. Um, you could just learn so much from, from um, how expansive it is. Um, I, I'm probably going to st steal your answer, but um, the first that comes to mind is David Driscoll, um, who, uh, the late David Driscoll, uh, who passed away uh, maybe a year ago, maybe two, um, who was a towering figure in Washington, D.C. He was an artist. Uh, he was a scholar and teacher um, and a collector, but not just of African-American art. He collected um, you know, Japanese tapestries and 19th century American paintings, paintings by white artists. Uh, so there was a breadth and depth to, to his collection and um, a real sense of, uh, of uh, having a, a profoundly good eye. But I also think that he, he, wanted, to, um, he wanted to show the world um, what uh, African American collectors can do that we could put together these, um, these collections uh, that show gravitas and intellectualism, um, as well as you know, aesthetics and beauty. Um, and, uh, and he often wrote about 
works in his collection. So, so that was another aspect that I like to try to, to emulate um, that is right about the work. So definitely uh, David Driscoll. And then, and then just one more, um, Peggy, Peggy Cooper K. Fritz, uh, my, the late Peggy Cooper K. Fritz, also a friend of mine, who I, you know, I think was just, um, um, just tenacious about looking and finding uh, young, emerging black talent and, uh, and doing whatever she could to, to promote their careers. Uh, oh, thank you. Speaking of Peggy, thanks for bringing her up because she, I had the honor of working with her. We ran into each other at an art show years ago and it was after she had lost the bulk of her collection in a fire, a horrible house fire. And she asked me to help rebuild her collection. Um, and I felt so honored. Um, and so right before she, she passed away, she published a book, um, Fired Up and Ready to Go. And in that book, I have like little tabs of all the works that I bought in tandem with the works that I bought, like me traveling to all these different places I would literally buy like two or three works. One work was hers and one work was mine. And uh, just to have that, that sort of connection with her and framing the work or bringing the work to her home or helping her hang it, it was just a very intimate um, process. Um, and I just feel so honored to, to have been able to, um, to help her you know, rebuild the collection. Uh, and from my end, I would go back to the values-driven collection or collecting. And what does that mean? Value system is different for different people, but I think for the museums, I would say values is about impact and risk-taking. And a lot of museums don't do that at time, and a lot of museums do not support emerging artists that are known because it's hard for us to justify the cost of somebody who doesn't have a CV. But I think it's our duty uh, to do a better due diligence and to take risks and acquire artists that, um, uh, or give artists opportunities that they haven't had. And um, I think we're doing a little bit of that. And there's always more that one can do, but um, you know, that I think it's an important thing for the museums to do now and into the future. So impact and what is that that you can pass on to next generation and learning. So, for everyone that participated in listening to this amazing, very rich dialogue, um, thank you all three for sharing all of these amazing resources and your personal stories about what led you to where you are now. And for all the beginning collectors that are in the room, we can continue the conversation not with the mics. So thank you guys for showing up. Thank you.